Good morning. Welcome everyone to the second installment of our land and how it has shaped us. A three-part seminar series on the history of CSUCI. I'm Daniel Banier, the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at CSUCI. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute has been in partnership with CSUCI for over 18 years, bringing the joy of learning to area adults ages 50 and over through university level courses. We present this seminar series in honor and celebration of our campus 20th anniversary. Thank you to our grantor and to our dedicated volunteers for making this event possible. In today's seminar, Evelyn Taylor, our university archivist, will present on the history of the Camarillo State Hospital. In the second half of the session, Dr. Colleen Delaney will moderate a panel discussion with special guests, including former state hospital employees and a historian whom she will introduce. Before we get started, I'd like to explain how this webinar will work. If you have any questions for our presenter or panelist, please enter them into the Q&A as the chat function has been deactivated. We will do our best to address each of your questions as time permits, but we cannot guarantee that we'll get to all of them. Thank you for joining us today as we continue this exciting and important series. Now, without further ado, Evelyn Taylor will begin her presentation. Good morning, good morning. I'd like to thank everyone for coming into this Zoom presentation of Camarillo State Hospital and Early Pictorial History. This is actually my very first Zoom presentation. So I'm very excited to have you all here as my test subjects. I'd like to thank you for volunteering and waivers will be at the door when you exit. So let me tell you a little bit about me. Fresh out of grad school, I was hired in September 2000 to organize, preserve, and provide access to the papers of Congressman Robert Lagomarsino, which is generally what archivists do. And then I was hired a couple of years later as the university archivist. Now, the words archives or archivist can be a little intimidating to some. It's not a word that gets thrown around a lot. Basically, I am a lot like a librarian. We do everything pretty much the same, although we do have some differences. I am biased though, because I do happen to love my archives because archives is original documentation that hasn't been edited and placed into books. It's information that results from an activity surrounding an entity, such as Camarillo State Hospital, or it can revolve around a person. Books are written based on archival material. And that is why the Camarillo State Hospital collection is so fun and interesting because it allows researchers to become informational explorers. When my friend Mary and I decided to write a book about the hospital, we really didn't realize that there wasn't a lot of historical documentation out there. All we had were the documents that were literally left in the units as they were closing. They were gathered up by former and current university employees. They were put in a box or two, and they were put in a hall closet in the old science building, which is exactly where the library sits today. The hope was, as I was told, was that students would want to know where their history came from. And that's why those employees, whom I thank all the time, kept the information for me and that I can now provide for you. As an archivist, you can only work with what you have. So much of the presentation that you're seeing today is based on the collection that we have in the archives. There's other options for resource, such as oral historian uh, projects and newspaper articles, which are always very handy and easy to find. But we basically work with what we have. I hope that I have met 
the balance of providing you with information that you're interested in, that you walk away and you're like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But also, I want to open up the conversation for discussion on the positive, positives and negatives of the hospital, not only from a historical point of view, but also from the present eye, the present point of view. So as Detective Joe Friday once said in the old television series Dragnet, which featured Camarillo State Hospital all the time, give me the facts, ma'am, just give me the facts. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you the facts, I'm gonna give you the puzzle pieces, and you're gonna get to make up your own mind. Dragnet was one of a few shows at that time that always mentioned Cam Camarillo State Hospital. But interestingly enough, 20 years later, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the show Baywatch, but Baywatch actually had, okay, Baywatch takes place in Santa Monica. Baywatch actually had a Camarillo State Hospital patient escape. Don, uh, physician's outfit with a stethoscope and the whole bit and show up at the pier in Santa Monica. Okay, we're not even going to go through the physical impossibilities and logistics on that one. We're just going to accept the fact that that was TV land. But just know that you come from um, a hearty line of um, Camarillo State Hospital television and movie um, historical uh, documentation, I guess, if you want to call it that way. So let's get on with the show. I have lots of information. And there'll be a Q&A after. Of course, I'm not gonna be able to cover everything. So I've tried to provide a, a general um, timeline for you and I hope you enjoy the show. As you can see, this is a map that I think was dated in the 50s. Um, it looks familiar. Uh, probably to uh, many people at the time, you still have the Camarillo State Hospital. It looks like there's a bit of the farmland. That's why I'm kind of thinking that it's from the 1950s, but it really is a lovely map because it gives you a great eye view about the whole Rancho Guadalajara era, which you just learned about with Colleen Delaney earlier this week. The land upon uh, Channel Islands, where Channel Islands sits now, belonged to Isabel Yorba as part of the grant known as Rancho Guadalajara. Isn't that a lovely picture? I just love this, this photograph. It really has this haunting quality about it, I think. So the story goes that Isabel married a lieutenant in the Spanish army. And after his death, she petitioned the governor for a land grant. She then applied for and was granted the additional land, which became over 30,000 acres with approximately 925 heads of cattle and 70 horses. Now, she eventually sold some of that ranchero for $28,000 and change in gold, where the remains of the state went to her adopted daughters. Rancho Guadalajara, as you can see here in this lovely map, was eventually parceled off, as we know, and sold to various county residents, including Joseph Lewis in 1906. And here we have a wonderful map of the possible completion of each building. It was dated around 1996. It was probably something that the university commissioned for one of their projects. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. It, it, it kind of helps figure out when things were built. There was a mishmash of building going on. During the 40s, during the war, a lot of construction was stopped um, at the women's site at the North Quad because I ran out of supplies. So this is a very helpful map, I think, for those of us who have questions about when things began and when things 
ended. So this drawing I love as well. So this was an original ink drawing by Alfred Eichler, which appeared in the Camriel News on September 25th, 1932. The designer of the hospital was Howard Hazen and the state architect was George McDougall. And he later proclaimed that the landscaped architecture will transform the hospital into one of the most beautiful spots in California. And as you can see, there are a bazillion courtyards, which is exactly what they wanted. They wanted the patients to come out into the sunlight, get out of the hospital beds and enjoy the beautiful surroundings. And speaking of haunting, this bottom picture always kind of gives me the creeps, right? It's a little bit like, Whoa, but it's still pretty cool because you get to see what was happening as it was happening then. Gives us a nice idea about the layout of the hospital. One of the first three buildings built the Bell Tower building completed in late 1936 reflects Howard Hazen's California presentation of the Mediterranean and Spanish styles that were so popular in California from 1910 to 1940. The belief was that the patients would feel better enjoying the beautiful environment. And that is why we have so many places where patients can go and enjoy it the exterior of the building. Examples of the Moorish architecture can be seen, especially in this bottom photo, which I'm sure that most of you recognize as being outside of the South Quad, the bell tower with that beautiful tile work and the, the ceramic tile on the fountain. You've got the arches, you've got the ornamental stucco. So just really beautiful. I have spent some time trying to figure out where this is, this building. It's the angle I think that's throwing me off. So in Q&A, if anybody has an idea, please let me know because I, I go back and forth from North Quad to South Quad. So I'm asking for help here because I am just thrown off by the angle. So as of 1936, when Camarillo opened, there were 20,000 patients in the state hospital system. Patton State Hospital from down below in San Bernardino area housed the largest population at 4,225. And I'm sure that most of you who have been on campus recognize this plaque and the arches at the front of the Bell Tower building. So scheduled for the first construction was the Bell Tower and the two buildings to the right and the left, approximately right and left. If you're facing the bell tower today, the building in front of it to the right currently now stands the student union. That was originally the house style for the hospital and later became the first CI library. The house of style, true to its name, was where parents received clothing. The building to the left of the bell tower is Ojai Hall. And here is a current map. 
kind of gives you a little bit of idea about placement. The initial units of the hospital in the South Quad included a series of low red roofed buildings with enclosed patios or courtyards. Patients were encouraged to keep busy. There were exercise facilities and various sports, including tennis, softball, and badminton. And there was also needlework and painting classes and all kinds of other crafts. Do you recognize where the bottom photo was taken? I'll give you a hint. It's in the South Quad. I liked this newspaper article because it's basically how the outside world viewed Cameron State Hospital, the red tiled city. I know it's not the easiest to read, but you take what you can get while you're looking at old newspapers. I was happy to get this newspaper from the Los Angeles Times because it's usually the Oxnard Daily Press or the Oxnard Daily Courier, which was carrying news about Camarillo. So I've always wondered who the man in the bolo hat was. As it turns out, the son of that gentleman, Carl Geisler, came to visit me shortly after the Broom Library opened around 2007. I found out that his father, Louis Geiser, the man in the black bolo hat in this picture, was a contractor who was awarded at least two, two units in the South Quad. And here is Louis standing here in the photo with the state official and the new patient wards. So I actually got to sleep at night because it was keeping me up. I was trying to figure out who is this guy? because he's actually in the next photo as well. Do you recognize what this is? Not much has really changed today. Uh, of course, we don't see the mural in the back of the gear, but pretty much it looks like the same place. Such beautiful architecture. So the hospital was expected to cover over 200 acres with supply wards and homes for the superintendent and officials and dormitories for the employees and the patients and commissaries and storerooms and all sorts of different places. So you have a photo of the male ward and a photo of the female ward. Does anyone recognize what the bottom photo is? Are you digging the old cars? It's kind of fun, isn't it? I wish I was a car buff because then I could tell you exactly what each car was and what year, but unfortunately I'm not. But this is a lovely uh, set of photos from the viewpoint of the bell tower. I thought this photo was really interesting. Um, it's the men's unit. We date it around the 1950s. And I think you can see a bad mitten set sort of to the right and to the back. They all look like they're having a pretty good time, probably playing checkers or chess or cards. At least they're out and about, which is a good thing. So this is the women's unit dated the 50s as well. With the overcrowding in the state hospitals at over 35% by January of 1937, 300 women patients arrived very quickly to Camarillo from Patton, again, down near San Bernardino and Norwalk hospitals making the first contingent of women arriving to the new hospital. And again, the women's 
completion was uh, took a little bit longer than expected because the war just happened to be going on and they lost supplies that were designated for the hospital. So we can understand that, right? But eventually it finished and it became a, you can see the red roofed tile, perfect picture. Looks like some people in the photo are just sort of relaxing and hanging out and enjoying the grass. So here's the uniforms of the day. These are kind of what we remember, right? Uh, we have the um, attendants uniform to the right and then the nurses uniforms to the left. Cam actually had a student nursing program for many, many years. The nurses program gave students classroom and clinical work along with practical experience. The nurses went through a 12 week course at the hospital where the average class numbered around 25. And every 12 weeks, a new class entered the program. The students worked from 6 a.m. in the morning, five days a week, they lived in the dormitories. They attended classes until three. They wore their uniforms during the normal hospital time. And then they changed into more of a street clothing when they went to go work in the children's sections. The nursing program at Camarillo had students participating from Cal Lutheran College, Moorpark College, Oxnard, and Ventura Colleges. Isn't that a lovely postcard? I just love this postcard. I love the cactus. Somebody had to be very brave to get all these photographs while amongst the cactus. That's all I have to say, because that Choya cactus is no fun if it gets on you. The times, they were a changing. Construction continued and the farm and the ranch flourished. So approximately 150 patients worked the ranch eight hours per day with the extra help coming from the main hospital when workers were needed for the harvest. Patient duties included spreading fertilizer, plowing and loading the wagons with farm produce. And by all accounts, they loved it. They were even allowed to drive, to drive the, the wagons. So they had a good time. Another photo I just love, right? Isn't it so pretty? I bet you can find that when you go out of uh, the university area there. I dare you to try to find that farmhouse. Eight thousand acres. That's quite a bit. So this was the outpost housing for the farmhands. And of course, we all know the story about the little lima bean. Various, various variations of the story are out and about, but we do know that it came from Lima, Peru. So there you go. We have some facts. So the farm had a hay shed, cat pens, corrals, with that cows, horses, chickens, hogs. They were all located on a 20 acre site for the most part. We had the little piggies. Sorry about that, I wanna give you a chance to read. So the farm and the ranch began in 1929 and lasted until about 1969. It was one of the very last farms on a state hospital to close.
The farm and the ranch began in 1929, keeping the hospital self-sufficient and independent. Nevertheless, as early as 1962, operations were in danger of closing. At the time, Camarillo had a herd of about 500 cattle of which 250 produced milk. And so it was very economical for the hospital to produce its own milk. However, certain state administrators and the current hospital director, Lewis Nash, did not think that the state hospital should be in the dairy business. Their words, not mine. Anybody recognize this building? It's kind of not there anymore, but we've all heard of it, right? The scary dairy. And so it was in 1969, the farm closed. I love this article, I have to confess. It, I mean, it cracks me up if you read the second paragraph and uh, one of the uh, ranchers is talking about an escapee that wandered onto his ranch, threatened to kill him and he'd stuck feathers in his hair and came at him with a club. I know that was not a happy situation for that rancher, but when I read it, I just crack up. And I confess, I, I just crack up. There's just something about the feathers in the hair that just makes me laugh. But it is a realistic scenario that happened. And I thought that it was a very informative newspaper article. And it, plus it had a great photo of the hospital. So I thought you guys might enjoy it. The institution increased from 100 patients to approximately 2,500 before the first year's end, and the outside communities took notice. The Oxnard and Camarillo newspapers began carrying Camarillo State Hospital news as regular columns. We got to know when Auntie May was coming from Chicago to visit someone at Camarillo, or they were leaving to go back to Kansas. I mean, it was very personal. And here we have a great view of that area where you can see the power plant and the exhaust stack, the laundry and all, of course, all the other areas that were that are in that area even today, right? Already in 1941, Camarillo was the third largest hospital in California. So here are the physician houses on the right, which I think are just adorable, and then the employee apartments on the left, I've met people who've lived in both and they always thought that they were very comfortable and were very happy to live there. It was very economical and convenient and they really wish that they had kept them. Here is another lovely pictorial view, aerial view of that whole residential area. So the new receiving and treatment building or the hospital building as it was known and the new administration building were started in 1949. The hospital building was expected to have 800 beds and they tried to create what they termed as a dream house. It was a sprawling two to three story building which was earthquake proof 
and designed for the modern concepts of treatment. It would house patients generally uh, who were going to stay just a short period of time. That was the original plan. It didn't turn out to be that way towards the end of, of their building. The suites were homey in size and decor. They were decorated in pastel shades, such as pink and blue and purple and yellow. They were furnished with very colorful chairs and tables and draperies. They tried to make it as homey as possible. The bathrooms and the kitchens even had that color tile. And if you think of 1950s kitchens and bathrooms, that's probably what, what you would see at this period of time with those pinks and yellows and blues and grays. So my question to you is, do you know where this building is? Do you know what this building was? It's not here today. In the same, well, actually it is, but it's got a different name, I should say that. And here is our formal invitation for the receiving and treatment center. They were basically running out of room in the north and south quads. And so that's why building the receiving and treatment center was so important. This building is no longer with us, which is unfortunate in a way. It was beautiful. This was the hospital administration building. And it later became uh, the uh, Channel Islands administration building for a while. It had bulletproof glass, doors heavier than what you weighed, at an old fashioned telephone booth. You know, the kind where you go in, you sit down, you make a call, and then you come out looking like Superman. There were various operated rooms at the hospital. They had an observation gallery for students. They had dental and optical offices. They had a pharmacy, special uh, physical therapy rooms, a commissary, kitchen, dining rooms. Later, they designated six wards to house the elderly. There were various day rooms with patios to encourage patient gatherings, and there was uh, occupational uh, therapy centers that offered weaving and painting and ceramics. And as far as television goes, that was very popular. The patients, by all accounts, were avid viewers who tended to prefer Western-themed television shows. And I can only assume because they were probably wishing that they could just get on a horse and go galloping out of the hospital area. This gives you a really nice view of the hospital at the bottom screen. So where they top building, the first administration building, where that was, was actually the parking lot. If you're facing the current library to the right, that parking lot, that's where this building was. It basically backed up to the old hospital building. Had a lovely courtyard. So this is an original photo regarding Camarillo's Head Hospital, as you can see. I think it's pretty cool. I love the decorative work on it. A significant piece of legislation, the Lanterman Developmental Disabilities Act 
also known as the Lanterman Act, is a California law proposed by assembly member Frank D. Latterman in 1973. And it gave people with developmental disabilities the right to services and support to enable them to live a more independent and normal life. And here is a map, obviously, of the hospital grounds. Now, I looked at the bottom right hand with a magnifying glass, and it looks like it's dated 1970. Now, the ranch and farm supposedly ended in 1969-ish, I guess. So it might be that the map you know, just they just didn't change it. It was a map that that was available in the mid '60s, and they just you know reprinted everything. They didn't change it, but it's pretty cool because it gives you a really nice layout of uh, where everything was. Um, it even mentions that canteen, right, which is now El Dorado Hall. That's where patients could go and they could buy hamburgers and Coca Colas and basically kind of just hang out. You can also see where it mentions about a shoe shop. We know they had beauty shops, right? And um, uh, talks about the storerooms. It mentions the bakery. It has a lot of information on it for just a little map. You can see where the children's units were and the homes. So I found this statistic documentation, which I thought was really interesting. You could see where Camarillo, obviously highlighted in yellow, and you could see where in the 50s, how it grew from 1,000 patients all the way up to, uh, what, 7,266. And then it gradually depleted down to 1970 to 2,000 patients. And you can see how it compares, obviously, to the other state hospitals in the area. So initially, when they began taking children in 1939, the children were incorporated with the patient population, boys with men and girls with women. This changed in 1947, thank God. However, based on the information that I found, teenagers were not taken out of the general population until 1955. At that time, Assistant Superintendent Lewis Nash felt that the teens should have their own separate program. And by August of 1968, four units and an accredited high school which later came to be known as the Lewis Nash High School, was established for 14 to 19 year olds. The program originally consisted of two doctors and 60 children undergoing treatment for emotional or behavioral problems. It was the first of its kind in a mental hospital west of the Mississippi. In 1981, two re-education homes were added. Children living in a home-like setting attended school while being involved in community service activities throughout the week. The idea was to reintegrate the children back into society, into their family homes, if possible. They basically wanted to mimic familiar surroundings. The hospital also implemented similar environments for adults such as placing them in cottages instead of hospital rooms in the hopes of reintroducing them back into society. In fact, Camarillo conducted a pilot project in 1965, one of the first of its kind in the nation, whereby adult patients lived and worked outside the hospital.
The Children's Center, which consisted of boys ages seven through 15 and girls seven through 17, provided a structured environment with a family-like atmosphere. Approximately 85% of the children had a history of violent behavior, but they didn't suffer from severe physical, sensory, or neurological issues. Each child also had an individualized educational program, which also accommodated the needs of each age group and condition. They had their own swimming pool, basketball courts. They had a petting zoo. I saw this newsletter and I thought it was really kind of fun. I know it's a little bit hard to read, but they had a therapy dog, which I didn't know about until I saw this, uh, named Echo. It was Mountain Valley School. So it was the, the high school that was here and or junior high too. And I just loved all of the comments um, by the kids about Echo. I thought that was really cool and sweet. So here's an uh, interesting piece of history. So in 1961, Los Angeles businessman, Perry Whiting, he was the owner of the Los Angeles Building Supply Company. He was once a patient here at Camarillo in the 1940s. He willed almost $100,000 to the hospital to be used for the benefits of the patients. So they took a poll among staff about what the patients would enjoy the most that they didn't have, and they came up with a swimming pool. And so the Perry Whiting swimming pool was constructed. It was located near uh, the South Quad. The bell tower area is sort of to the back of this photo, next to the Haggerty Gym. It was pretty good size, and they used it for quite a long time, even after I got here. It was demolished in 2004 to make room for Aliso Hall, the science building. In 1957, California's Assembly Ways and Means Committee added to the state's proposed budget for construction of three chapels at Camarillo, which brought the total to $386,000 dedicated to the chapel. Services were offered in the Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant religions to both staff and patients. And of course, the chapels are located just to the, uh, well, if you're facing the Broom Library to the right on Chapel Way. So patients here actually learned how to package machinery to shrink wrap and blister pack local business products. Patients also separated cutlery, they packaged balloons, assembled computer parts and drug testing kits, and they even labeled wine bottles. The workers operated with a time clock, they had an hourly wage, they were paid holidays and vacations. Over 120 patients participated at any one time, some of them working for outside vendors such as 3M products and Jaffra cosmetics. The operation paid for itself, generating approximately $230,000 a year. I think that's quite a bit. The hospital also addressed unemployment issues faced by former patients who are out in the community. One program used the hospital bakery as an instrument of teaching 120 men ages 18 to 45. Other on-the-job training projects included painting, upholstery, sewing, janitorial, and groundskeeping services.
do you recognize this building? This is in the South Quad. So the Lanham and Petra Short Act required that for involuntary hospitalization, a person must be dangerous to himself, dangerous to others, or unable to provide himself or herself with food, clothing, or shelter because of a mental disorder. The legislation also provided for strict time limitations for involuntary hospitalization, an initial 72 hour period for evaluation and treatment, and 14 days maximum for intensive treatment. A judge, secretary, bailiff, public defender, and district attorney concluded court proceedings to provide hospital clients with a right of due process. And for a time, I remember learning that we had our own client advocate here at the hospital on a permanent basis. Here's another great piece of information. So you can see Camarillo high, uh, highlighted in uh, yellow. To the right, it talks about the different mental disorders that attributed, were attributed uh, from 1953. It's kind of interesting to see how they label quote unquote disorders, right? So we had 14 senile, manic depressive 70, schizophrenia seems to be the highest, I think. Well, no, schizophrenia was 266, psychosis 539. And it kind of gives you an idea again about how we compare to the other state hospitals at the time. And here we have another photograph of the old administration building with a bunch of old guys and old women. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And here's an interesting chart about Camarillo and where everybody came from. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Los Angeles police found it very convenient to pick up people who they thought were drunk and disorderly and haul them off to Camarillo. So um, it's kind of actually verifies that because if you look at Los Angeles, look at how many came from Los Angeles area. That's kind of a lot. So a lot of our, our patients involuntary patients came from Los Angeles. Now, of course, they had apparently a very successful drug and treatment center where people were uh, would volunteer to come. I don't think this counters that because the timeline doesn't seem to be correct. So yeah, there you go. You can see uh, all the other populations as well. I like the way they broke it down. So here's a fun little map I thought was kind of cool, right? Uh, um, kind of gives you all the highlights. It's a timeline. It's a it's a time piece, really. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers Marine Land, but I do. That was very fun. That was, uh, I think, down in San Diego, right? I'm surprised they don't mention uh, Jungle Land, but maybe Jungle Land had closed by that time. You know, that was in uh, that was so I thought that was kind of fun. And the other cool thing is that it talks about the services that were provided here. So lots of information on one little pamphlet. So I, I could not possibly fit every movie or video or television series on this slide. And I'm always learning about ones. People are always telling me about, oh, that was filmed here. This is filmed here. I did my best. And I'm sure that we can add to it 
But I love this mural, which is in the North Quad at the Walk of Fame. I thought it's just really cool and whimsical and fun. If you haven't seen NSYNC's I Drive Me Crazy video, you have to YouTube it. It's hysterical. It, yeah, if you, if you need a laugh for the day, you got to watch that one. I had signatures, photograph, autographed uh, photos regarding Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the X-Files. And I went through any way I could think of to try to find what episodes they were talking about, why, why, you know, they were filming here. Could not, could not. I mean, for years, it's taken me like, how long have I been here? A long time. 20 years, I could not find. Finally, last semester, I decided to take another tack and looked in a different way for information. And I actually found the Buffy the Vampire Slayer episodes that they were talking about that were filmed on Camarillo and the X-Files. So if you wanna know, email me and I'll be happy to um, give you that information. And the interesting thing about Buffy, I have to say, is that you wouldn't know that it was Camarillo State Hospital unless you were here in the very early years as the university was transition transitioning because they took place in the morgue down below where, you know, my in the library where my collections are, right? So I remember when it looked like before it got uh, torn apart and, and sort of whitewashed. So there's very few people on campus today who would actually be able to identify. So I'm very proud of myself that I got it, but it took me 20 years. And we have some more murals from the Walk of Fame in the North Quad. So Steve Axel did many of the murals he actually worked as a psych tech. Before Steve was an employee here at Camarillo, he worked at El Tascadero State Hospital up north. Chuck Berry came to the hospital to perform and Steve's band got to play the concert with him. So this is Steve's tribute to Chuck Berry. Here's another one of Steve's murals. And again, I'm limited on who I could name who stayed here. I could technically only go with what was published in the newspaper articles. And of course, as years went by, less and less of publications about people who were at Camarillo came out. So that's why so many of these are very dated. But I've heard rumors about other people, definitely. But I love the Hotel Camarillo bar and saloon, I'm assuming, right? So I had to post this photo of the pharmacy staff, the medical staff, because I loved this flyer that they apparently had in their office. It just sort of cracked me up about the coffee and the bun burner and the whole bit. Those of you who used to use bun burners, to make coffee, you'll know what I'm referring to. It was a scientific experiment in and of itself. So Camarillo's variety of special care benefited Ventura College's nursing and psych tech program for many years. The psych tech program, which began in 1971, trained approximately 90 students a year it was a year-long program where students would spend 10 to 12 years, 10 to 12 years, it may have seemed like that, 10 to 12 hours a week studying and 26 hours per week working at the hospital. So no one can say that the hospital staff didn't have fun with themselves and the clients. We got a little tap dancing. We've got some softball going on. We have parades. We have Camelot 
Camelot, the newsletter, which was really fun to read. I have a few of those issues. And it talks all about what they're going to do with between the staff and also what they're going to do with the with the patients. The word barbecue. Can't miss that, right? And as most of you know, we probably uh, or have been there. We have the bowling alley, right? In 1956, the hospital's bowling alley was constructed. It consisted of four lanes. They were all manually operated. The staff controlled the lanes while the patients acted as the pin setters or the pin spotters, meaning they manually reset the bowling pins to their positions and they cleared the fallen pins and they returned the bowling balls back to the pins. As early as 1955, patients at Camarillo participated in art therapy, which included exhibiting their creations at the very popular annual, annual festival of the arts. Camarillo offered an art program to build self-esteem and to encourage self-expression. From sculptures to ink drawings like we have here to paintings, patients could take up to 15 classes per week. They displayed their works at the lobby of a local theater, on the second floor of a bank building, the county fair, and many community members bought them. In fact, Cheech Marin of Cheech and Chong was a very public advocate of the program and regularly bought the art made by the patients. So the patients created their own shows at the hospital. They also had control room responsibilities, such as handling cameras and sound equipment, acting as a light, the lighting director or the makeup person. It was the only such project in the nation. It had a staff of about 40 and about 300 patients operating it. Channel six programming ranged from quiz shows to newscasts. It was transmitted all through the hospital. And what's really cool is that a huge supporter of this project was Jack Warner Jr., son of Warner Brothers co-founder, Jack L. Warner. Jack Jr. was so involved with the project that he persuaded other Hollywood studios to provide the station with technical equipment and advisors. I also love this piece on the right because it gives you an idea about the different departments that were here. It even shows that they had a library. Music therapy, talks about the swimming pool. So from the beginning, really, of the hospital, there was always a variety of organizations from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara that took Camarillo's children and its adult patients under their wings. The Humane Society brought in puppies. Various other organizations supplied toys and indoor and outdoor play equipment. Military, military organizations had ball games and board games and barbecues. And they even taught the children marching and cadence. Larger organizations held benefit luncheons and dinners that brought in famous actors and actresses from all over. Volunteers would often provide female patients with grooming sessions regarding hair, nails, makeup, and even fashion. For five hours a day, autism patients received speech and language services rehabilitation exercises, and music therapy. The hospital's volunteer program began in 1942 with a foster grandparent program 
initiating 30 years later. The grandparents, age 60 and over, worked four hours a day, five days a week, receiving a stipend of $1.60 an hour, woohoo, plus $1.75 transportation fees, as well as a hot lunch. I'm sure that the hot lunch is what brought them in. They were definitely a very dedicated group. Pretty awesome people. So enhancing independence through innovation became the hospital's goal. It was to stabilize individuals and to return them to the community if at all possible. It kind of became their swan song. So here's an interesting thing about being an archivist. You never know what information you will find in your various collections that actually outreaches to other collections in your, in your, in your archives. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, shortly after Mary and I completed the book, I started working on the Jane Tomac collection. Now, Ms. Tomac was the first woman council person and mayor for Oxnard. She was also a trustee for the hospital. And because of that capacity, I was able to find this letter in the collection. It's from another trustee by the name of Louis Batista. He wrote to uh, Lannerman, or excuse me, he wrote to Nicholas Petrus, right, of the Lannerman Petrus short act that we talked about earlier regarding uh, time limitations for involuntary hospitalization. I know that this stands a little bit hard to read, but basically the trustee is questioning Petrus's intentions with the act and expressing his worry and anxiousness that the act is playing into the state governor's hands. Well, actually it's more government hand rather than just governor decisions to close a hospital altogether. Petrus actually agrees with Batista and states that he will oppose any plan to close the state hospitals. And of course, we know how well that worked out. So Camarillo State Hospital officially closed July of 1997. Four months earlier, in March, two parent groups filed a lawsuit against the Department of Developmental Services, which was the agency that was running Camarillo at the time, alleging that the closure would cause irreparable harm to the patients. It resulted in an order from the court that the hospital would not close until the state ensured that the patients would receive comparable care at other facilities. In the summer of 1999, CSU Northridge would temporarily inhabit the old hospital grounds, laying the seeds for the current California State Hospital, California State University, Channel Islands, you know, what we are now. If you're interested in pursuing the topic further, I have listed a variety of informational locations, I guess you could say. You could come to the library archives page, which is under the collections segment on the main library webpage. You could go to the library page and search Camarillo State Hospital for a variety of books. You could go to the Camarillo Public Library. You could go to Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And of course, Colleen's book, Rancho Guadalajara, will be out in the summer. So you have to, you have to grab that one. 
and support our faculty authors. We'll also have a copy here in the library. So I'd like to thank you for visiting the Hotel California. We hope that you had a pleasant stay and we hope to see you back again. Thanks for joining me on this Camarillo State Hospital a journey. Appreciate it. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask me uh, via email or um, in the uh, next segment, which is going to be the uh, question and answer period. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Appreciate that. Uh, we have a couple questions uh, and one statement. Actually, you asked very early on for the location of a particular uh, courtyard with a low building. And uh, I believe a campus person here on campus says, looking at Ojai Hall, the entrance that is now the handicap lot. So most likely that is that first, that location that you were asking about in your slides. Um, and then we have one question. You mentioned that patients could go to the ca cantina to purchase burgers and sodas. Did patients have to purchase their food while at the hospital? Oh, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I'm assuming no. I know that they had plenty of uh, dining options and dining areas. So if you, I, I'm assuming what happened was if you weren't interested in the special of the day, that you could go and and you know maybe go grab a milkshake or you know a, a hamburger you know that sort of thing so yeah as far as i know i haven't heard anybody saying that they had to pay for anything because they didn't really have money like you and i would have money so actually i will add to that in research for my book i saw a letter to one of the directors thanking him and saying money was enclosed for their relative so i think they had Ooh. spare i think they had spare change for things such as that but yes the regular okay. foods weren't uh, wasn't you know they did have to pay in the dining hall but i think maybe for some extras cool um one person asked what is the small building at the bottom of round mountain okay so that is the current Sage Hall, I think, right, Colleen? That looks like the current Sage Hall to me. Well, there is a small building. It depends which they're referring to as Round Mountain. Um, but oh, I get it. in the front. That if, if it was close to the what is today Sage Hall in the hospital, there was, a, I think, a little agricultural building there. Or if we're talking about big Round, oh, round Mountain behind me, right? The, po the powerhouse. Right. It's probably the yeah. powerhouse that's being referred to there. And um, I think we have time for one more question, and that was, when the hospital was closed, were the patients able to find other care? And some of that we will address in the panel session, but I don't know if Evelyn wanted to briefly. Yeah, that. well, that's where things get sticky. Um, so in some, from what I've read, so basically the state said to the counties and the cities, Okay, it's your turn now. And so they in turn reached out to private entities, which sort of um, sprouted up. And uh, many of the patients who were able to, well, who they said were able to leave, went to the private areas. Um, those that probably it was mostly developmentally disabled, I think, went to other state hospitals. Also, uh, the children uh, went to a Metropolitan down in LA, Patton down in San Bernardino. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's the question of the day, I think, is, is where did they all go and why? Right. And I think actually our panelists in, in the next section will be able to answer some of the questions. Uh, some of you have put some questions in the chat, which unfortunately we don't have time to get to, but actually, again, some of those I believe can be answered by our panelists. Um, so we're going to take a very brief five minute break uh, in case people need to step away for a minute. It is currently 1110. So we will see you all back here at 1115. Thank you.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. It is now 1115. So we're going to continue with the second part of our presentation on the history of Camarillo State Hospital as part of our 20th anniversary series here at CI. So first, I'm going to briefly introduce um, or tell you about our guests. We have Carol Cusera and Bill Wakeley, both of whom worked here while it was still the state mental hospital. And Nan Yamane, who was actually uh, worked during that transition period. So I'll ask the three of you to uh, briefly introduce yourselves and your roles here at the hospital. Let's begin with Carol. Hi, I want to thank Evelyn for all that good information. A lot of things I learned. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm Carol Cosera. I worked here from the 70s until the place closed in 1997 as a psychiatric social worker, licensed through the Board of Behavioral Examinations. And my role was, at the time, through the LPS or Lanaman Petra Short Act, which was mentioned, where um, they, we really were trying to push people out, even though they said they weren't. Uh, and my role at that time was to evaluate the people I worked with as residents, uh, their amenability to function in the community and work with the treatment team uh, to make those decisions. Thank you. Bill. Uh, yes, uh, I also was a psychiatric social worker for the County of Ventura for 25 years and worked in a number of outpatient and inpatient uh, duties. And when the LPS Act came in, as well as the Governor Reagan's plan to close the hospital, uh, the counties were required to assume responsibility for uh, the mentally ill and in the state hospitals. So I was given the assignment to, from scratch, to set up a aftercare system, which I called a continuing care team. And uh, I had an office at the state hospital with a social worker and a clerk. Uh, to help uh, monitor and decide how we could transition these people back to uh, the county. Thank you. And Nan? Hi, um, I'm Nan Toyamani, and uh, I have worked for CSUN. Um, CSUN was at a, um, a center in Ventura before moving to the new to our new place in uh, Camarillo. So, uh, yeah, and I, I work in the history department. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to begin with a set of uh, specific questions for each of the panelists and also as a group. For the audience members, if you have uh, specific questions for them, please put the name in the question if you want me to direct it to them. Otherwise, it'll be an open-ended question. We'll see which the panelists would like to answer. So first, we're going to focus on the uh, Cameron State Hospital uh, time period. So the, um, First, I'm going to ask some questions um, for uh, Carol and Bill. Both of you can answer. Um, what were the patient populations like at the hospital during your time here? Meaning well, diagnoses and, right? Yeah. Um, we had, uh, what I worked with was adult mentally ill patients, both men and women over the years. And uh, that mostly diagnosed with schizophrenia and what we call bipolar now, and uh, some dementia, not too many dementia patients, but a few, uh, but mostly schizophrenia was the diagnosis. Bill, do you have any other? Did you work with similar patient populations, Bill? He's here. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Also, um, when and why were patients permitted to leave the wards? So, for example, going to the jobs and visiting the canteen. Well, the, uh, there would be treatment plans. Uh, we worked as a team. There were doctors, social workers, rehabilitation therapists, uh, psych techs, and nursing people. And uh, we would have evaluations of how people were progressing. And um, if they were feeling well, following the rules, um, and they could ask to have what we would call ground villages. And uh, during team meetings, someone would request that 
and we'd have a meeting with the patient and explain to them what the rules were, if they had uh, ground privileges, what they would need to do. And if the staff felt that they were ready for it, they could walk on the grounds. And some people did just walk around because they needed the space to get out, or they had a job, or when they go to the canteen, or various uh, other things on the uh, grounds. So sure, a lot of people had ground privileges. And that's one of the things that most of the people really look forward to because uh, would you like to be locked up all day? <laughs> Not me. And the grounds are beautiful. So that was really a uh, part of the therapy really, being able to get out. Okay, um, could both Bill and uh, Carol, maybe Bill, we'll start with you. Could you describe a typical work day at your time at, uh, at CAM? Uh -huh. Well, um, as I said, I had we had an office out there to monitor patients, and I think at the time we had about 500 from the county. And uh, the challenges were quite large. Uh, we had to start a program from scratch. It ended up with 55 staff, and the difficulty was finding adequate housing and uh, different services. And that remained a challenge. And uh, the LPS Act, obviously, as Evelyn had mentioned, changed everything in terms of the difficulty in admitting people to an institution and having them stay very long unless they qualified for a conservatorship. Um, so it was a whole new ball game for the County of Ventura. And, Unfortunately, the side effects were that we have a lot of people on the street, which would have probably been in the hospital. And it was very hard to find adequate facilities in the community. Carol, what about a typical day for you? Well, typical, there were many typical days. And that was one of the interesting things about working here was that you never knew what was gonna happen. And uh, you were exposed to almost everything. But anyway, I remember the, when I first started to work here, uh, I was assigned to a unit with 70 uh, female adult patients and they hadn't had a social worker. And I walked on the unit and they, somebody said, ah, social worker. And they all converged around me at one time. And I thought, what should I do? Should I turn and run or what? But, um, as you, <laughs> there were a lot of people here at that time that didn't belong here, I must say, that and they needed a placement. And some of the people um, I couldn't tell from staff. I didn't know who was staff and who was a resident. Um, but a typical day would be uh, first you come in in the morning and you get a report from the unit team if anything happened overnight, if anyone was in trouble, any of the residents were having trouble or were assaultive, that could happen, or um, uh, were ill, meant, uh, physically ill or anything, if I needed to talk to any families regarding their progress. And then um, you would typically have a regular team meeting, a brief team meeting after that. Um, and um, then you would, uh, I had individual or group therapy on different days. And there were other days uh, where we'd, uh, we would uh, escort patients off the unit to get what was mentioning already was a canteen where they could, they did have, people did have uh, little amounts of cash that they could withdraw from the bank and they would go to the bank. So first we'd have to go to the bank with them. And these were mostly people who didn't have ground privileges. So you would escort them from the bank to the canteen or whatever, and they could buy things. Um, or if there was a group uh, therapy meeting, then that would be scheduled that day or in another day. And I had individual and group, as I mentioned. So we had one, I remember we used to have a women's group. We had a hospital beautician who would um, do, she washed the hair and then set it and all that kind of thing. And we could do it because there was a beauty shop. There were a lot of different activities that were going on during the day. Um, and then the rest of the time was do paperwork. You had to do, as you mentioned, conservatorships. Some patients were on conservatorship and you had to do an annual uh, court report as to how they were doing 
or they, we had some people who were on legal holds. You also had to do a report for that. So there was a lot of paperwork uh, involved in that too. We had to do monthly uh, notes in the residence charts to write how they were doing, whether they were progressing, uh, that kind of stuff. Thank you. And um, Carol, was there a particular preparation, knowledge, or training that you needed uh, to work at your position here? Um, I had um, a clinical social work degree from the University of Michigan. And Bill, I, what about? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Don't Go feel ahead. free to add more. No, that's all right. Okay. okay. Bill, what about your preparation to uh, serve the populations here? Um, well, we basically set up a parallel system because the county was traditionally just uh, dealing with outpatients and we're not involved with the seriously mentally ill. So it was quite a change for the county. So the system that uh, I was responsible to set up had, uh, we had day treatment, we had recreational therapy, we had dance therapy, music therapy. We had a number of things for people to do. We had case managers that were assigned to look after people that were in the community. We had a psychiatrist, we had psychologists. Um, and um, a whole new industry developed called board and care homes, which housed the majority of the people. Uh, some were six and under, and others were fairly large. Um, so we would send staff into there sometimes to do programs in their facilities or to assist them. Um, so anyway, it was... Um, uh, and a lot of people fell through the cracks, obviously, and some people had to be sent out of the county. Um, so um, we did what we could do, but uh, and then later uh, uh, they promised us adequate funding to develop uh, housing and other things, and, and unfortunately that rapidly disappeared and made it so we never could fully achieve the uh, hopes that we had for people that were returned. Which I, I think you answered my next question for you, but see if there's anything else you wanted to add. Because my question for you, Bill, was what role did Ventura Mental Health play in helping the students transition uh, patients back to the community? So was the question, the hope to go from the group, possibly group homes into independent living or... I, I think it was a little bit of everything. Uh, some people were able to go home and be with families and uh, others were placed in, uh, we did have operate a few facilities that we actually operated ourselves. Um, and those had a little better staffing and so on. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, it was, um, uh, the lack of funds eventually caught up with us, and things really went downhill from there. And uh, but we did have programs uh, in Simi Valley, Ventura, and in Oxnard, which Oxnard had the largest program. And uh, so um, it was a good start. Uh, unfortunately, if we look around on the streets, we can see that we have a serious problem and lack housing for people. Um, so we've got a long way to go. Right. And can either of you comment on changes in treatment over time at the hospital? I can attest to that. It was 100% better than when I began. Hmm. Um, <laughs> there was a lot, um, especially in the um, medications that were available in order to uh, treat the different um, di diagnosis with, with schizophrenia and other diagnoses, uh, especially with the bipolar, with the use of lithium, I saw was almost a miracle. What could it do for a lot of our patients? Um, there were uh, other means of uh, therapies available to that. Um, when I first came there, there wasn't really much available as far as um, treatment. A lot of, I, you come in and there would just be people sitting around. They could even smoke on their own, that, which was really awful. You 
come in on the unit and there'd be a haze, a mm. big haze and it would be smoke. And uh, thank God they stopped doing that. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, we got down to a workable level of patients. When I left the hospital it was like 38, 30, 40 was maybe the maximum of people, which was a lot. But then you could have people in groups, in different kinds of groups, and uh, according to what they might need, which wasn't done in the past. And over the years that evolved and it became much better in, uh, to figure out how to do that. The main thing was the treatment uh, of anxiety, behavior, acting out, assaultive behavior, which was mostly unfortunately done through medication or fortunately, I should say, really, because then you could work with people at that time. Um, uh, I agree with what Bill is saying that there were not adequate facilities available for people when they left the hospital to maintain the treatment that they got there, which was, as far as I could see, uh, really good treatment, especially at Camarillo because I worked at another hospital, which wasn't so good. But Camarillo was excellent. Uh, and it was unfortunate that it had to close. Uh, we are fortunate to have the university though, which is wonderful too. But um, I'm going on. So Bill, if you wanna say anything you can say. So I think, yeah, I think we understand that treatments got better over time, right? Compared to what you saw maybe in the snake pit, right? Which Absolutely. Was filmed here Absolutely. in the 1940s. There's no question about it. Yeah. yeah. So so I'm going to uh, shift to uh, Nan. So we have time to learn about this transition period. And then we'll go back to, and I'll, we'll get to the questions that the audience has posted. Um, so Nan, could you tell us about um, how the land and the remnants of the hospital affected the new population, right, at the university students faculty, staff, and administrators who came in starting in the late 1990s. Great. Um, I should have said, um, I, I just retired. So I am returning to this project and a lot that I have gathered and already written and, and attempting to finish it now that I have time. I'm very excited about that. But I was anxious to hear uh, the comments of, of Carol and Bill. Um, but uh, I think, I think the land and the place it was Camarillo State Hospital, it was formidable in its sheer size, its history, its beauty. As we all know, the land is very beautiful there. Um, and I think for many of the first generation of student staff and faculty who worked there in the initial years of the transition to the university, it generated this powerful curiosity about its past on the one hand, and also excitement about the promise of the future on the other, right? I think residents in Ventura had been, you know, hoping for a university. So it did represent a lot of excitement. Um, I, I just wanted to preface my comments with a few acknowledgements that I think are very important. Um, first is uh, that state hospitals such as Camarillo and earlier asylums, you know, they're hidden away from the larger society. And um, in theory, I think for reasons of perceived therapeutic advantage, but really in practice, perhaps, to remove this marginalized population, and they had no place in the mainstream society. Consequently, they ended up in jails and streets in the 19th century, as they do now, right? There's no place in, in the regular, in the, in the larger world. So, um, so these isolated hospitals, I think, were in some ways a way of offering a better life, um, but it was also the life that was acceptable, I think, to the larger society to have them away, right? So second, um, I'd want to say that the hospital begun in the 20s, opened in 1936. It became imposing and immense, both in the power of its physical location and in the space defined by many of its courtyards and buildings, right? Um, it was uh, by the 1950s and 60s, what I call a city within a city. It was, it was gargantuan and um, it was, and that was complicated. You know, it's a, it's an interesting idea to have this, this city that's a little bit different inside um, this larger region, right? Um, but uh, the point is 
that um, I think it made it a lot of people in, in Ventura and the larger areas, I think chose to um, ignore this, this large institution, right? In the middle of their, uh, you know, where people lived. And I mention this because a lot of the people I interviewed and their stories are people who really cared about the hospital. So I wanna put it in a larger context of really um, a, a world where people, uh, a lot of people didn't care, right? Um, so finally, I wanna mention that, you know, I have replaced a lot of my initial ideas about hospital life with stories of real people who've lived and work in this place. And I have a great deal of respect for Camarillo's large and layered past. It, it's very big. So um, all of the people that I've interviewed along with the research that I've done have really only exposed uh, past hospital life in a portion of what I would uh, say was Camarillo State Hospital. So um, it's just a little bit, There, there is, a lot, a lot of work for everybody to do, right? So um, with these acknowledgements in mind, um, I, I can say that I think for a lot of people here who moved from the center and a lot of the students, there was a great deal of curiosity. Um, after all, you know, the hospital's past was still very present. You had, you had the buildings that even smelled like a hospital, right? And then you had people who had become, uh, who had worked there and then took jobs with the university. So you had people who also knew about hospital history. Um, you also had a couple programs that had been left uh, from the county. Um, they're very small, but they were there. People were still working there. And then um, you also had the surrounding community. And by that, I mean, um, a lot of the people who had worked here, you had uh, generations of families who had worked here from the Great Depression uh, through the war and up through the 60s and 70s. And I think that they had um, a lot of stories. So for example, some of the first students who, lo who were local and came to Camarillo had been uh, raised on some of those stories. Uh, one of our students did a, a video of the Scary Dairy and um, it was very creative <laughs> because as the as he was coming of age, you know, the, the hospital was in its last years and um, a lot of the buildings had been neglected and left. But the dairy was in the periphery, you know, and it had been you know, dilapidated and by the time, you know, we had gotten here. So um, so while curious about the past. I think students were also excited about the possibilities. And, and I think history students may have been especially engaged in these questions about Camarillo's history because of their passion for the past. And also for the same reason, they were excited about the possibilities of preserving its legacy as an enduring part, I think, of the university's future. Students were really as excited as I was. Um, so um, I don't want to talk too much. I just want to say um, I took a two-page history of the hospital and I have no idea who wrote it. And I um, expanded it uh, based on, on interviews and, and people I spoke to into, into um, eras, right? And so the earlier era was this era of um, physicality. In other words, a lot of the attendants they hired were really big. Um, they used restraints sometimes because they didn't have the drugs, right? So from 1929 to 1949, I really think of it as going from a ranch to a hospital. And um, for each of these periods, I've sort of arranged it biographically. And then um, from 1949 to 1959, when, camera, when they opened up the receiving and treatment center, um, when, when I call it a city within a city, there was a huge population of patients. There was overcrowding. Uh, by the end of the decade, there were also exposés that I think were the precursor to the later reforms, right? But, um, but that receiving and treatment center brought a lot of hope that you could take people from what they called the backwards and actually give them workable treatments. And I think as Carol said, uh, the, the drugs did a lot of good in terms of helping patients. And um, 
So um, then the period after from 1959 to 1976, the era of the uh, Lannerman Petrus Short Act, the reform era, um, of course, there was a lot of, I think this is the period where you see a lot of positive change and we, we can hear it um, in your stories, but I can't imagine the number of people that you dealt with. <laughs> Carol, you said at one time 70, reduced to 40. Um, I, I can't imagine. I mean, these are people that need you know, a lot of help. So, um, and then just one more point that I would like to make, it interests me greatly. And that is um, when they had the grand jury investigation, 1976, mm -hmm. And they said there wasn't adequate you know, leadership and at the hospital, that there were major problems. It's very interesting because in the 1950s, in the era of the war, you had superintendents. You had you know, one person on top of this whole hospital, and, and there weren't the divisions by, you know, um, by, by um, uh, illnesses and problems that people had. So... That was a that was a large journey, you know, from from the era of the superintendent to one um, after 1976, where the hospital is divided up into more, you know, adequate, um, you know, units. I think. Um, so, um, anyways, that's that's what I've done, and um, I sort of started with the the oldest and those people who had experience the earliest you know, and have worked up. So um, students were incredibly interested. I mean, they did a number of stories. Um, one, of, one of our students uh, interviewed Steve Axtell on his murals and um, others did um, interviewed um, social workers and psychologists. Of course, we didn't, we didn't interview patients on occasion, uh, patients would um, come come to campus, volunteer. They would they would come back to look around, which uh, was also an opportunity for us to learn something. So, um, so I sort of took this narrative and expanded it, and students filled in, and and um, interviewees filled in a lot, and then um, we began to do tours. Uh, hospital tours in October and you know about the time of the day of the dead so I wrote a basic script for it and and they grew to be quite quite big and I think that reflected the interest of the community right so um I wrote a basic script and then students expanded it they made it theatrical they did a tremendous job in in growing this um this tour it was very collaborative. And um, because the hospital history is so big, it really needed a lot of people to do it. So um, anyways, that's, uh, I guess, I, you know, I could talk for a long time about um, a lot of the work that people did, but I think that um, energy uh, came from the, the place. You know, historians don't often have have uh, material and artifacts and uh, in front of them, they're not often uh, there in the moment. So for me, it was really marvelous. And I think for many of the first students. And what do you think the memory of Camarillo State Hospital can teach us today? So I was thinking, and, and I was thinking um, uh, with Bill's comments, uh, that I, I think one of the important legacies was uh, Franklin Hunter Garrett. He was head of the hospital in the 50s. And I think that um, he helps us to understand this, these tremendous complexities that were involved in, in caring for patients. And, and I think of um, mentally ill patients and also some developmentally disabled patients as being some of the most powerful, powerless uh, people in our society, right? It's it's not an easy problem. So there's a lot we can we can learn from the past in terms of their care, and I think especially him. He ended his career by saying, 
um, he was predicting the trend toward community care. This, this was an old idea that, that people saw coming. And he hoped that communities would educate themselves about mental illness and developmentally dis disabilities so that they could better you know, deal with people in their communities. And I think this is kind of where we are, and I'm not sure how well we've all done with it. Uh, so I think placing a university also in a place, in the place of the old hospital, I think it's been a wonderful way of preserving the hospital's legacy and of considering the meaning of these lessons and you know, through the prism of a variety of disciplines, right? So um, along with hospital stories, um, the students uh, gathered a lot of stories from, from the local areas, you know, surfers, uh, people who lived in the Ventura River Basin. Um, also, uh, there was a lot of interest in military history. Encouraged by my colleague Steve Bork, who's a military historian, but also the CB base and Point Magoo were right here, right? And we also had a lot of students, as we do now, who were or are military, right? So um, I got to say that these local stories really inspired our students. Um, by the time, I mean, after a couple of years, uh, we had a history club of 50 students, up to 50 students. It peaked at 50 students. Now, if any of you have tried to help <laughs> encourage people to come to come out, come to events, even virtually, it's it's impossible, right? I mean, I thought the Zoom would help uh, allow us to come together, right? But we had such such interest in the hospital, and I think it was uh, this place and, and the promise of their future. I think it really was key in um, in bringing these people together and and really energizing their studies. I think it really, um, it made a, a tremendous difference. Uh, that's, that's a very, um, they did a lot more. You know, they published a newsletter. Um, they were, they, they felt ownership of this new university. It was difficult because they were technically CSUN students. You know, so for example, when they did the CI newsletter or Channel Islands newsletter, um, they were told they had to change the name, <laughs> but, but students didn't see those uh, divisions. I mean, they saw themselves as really part of starting a new university, and they were very, very excited about it. So I think both of these things were very important, and I think it shows the power of, of kind of collaborative work and um, sense of purpose that um, being here in this moment left them. Thank you. So before we move to questions, I wanted to ask each of our panelists, if in, you know, maybe in only about a minute, is there anything about your knowledge, your experiences here that, that I didn't ask about that you want um, our community here to know about, um, you know, your experiences at Camarillo? So Carol, do you have anything else to add? Yeah. I just want people to know that the people that worked here were some of the um, most caring people that I've ever met. And uh, you see, I hate to see these movies about <laughs> the snake pit, which was built here. But uh, that, unfortunately, is what a lot of people think of mental hospitals when they think of mental hospitals. But from what I saw around me and the people I worked with, uh, uh, you know, that is not true. So uh, I know there were some problems in the past here, uh, and there probably still are in other hospitals and that did happen at Camarillo too. But and the people I work with, a lot of them are my lifelong friends and uh, they worked hard under some very trying circumstances at times. So I want people to appreciate the people that worked here. Yeah. And, and. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. One. Uh, the downside of the LPS Act was that you could not, it was very difficult to require uh, people who were in the community who were mentally ill to receive treatment. Uh, you had the LPS Act, so you could hospitalize somebody on a, a doctor's order or psychologist, 
and it bit them for three days. And then they had to go before court to go to stay 14 days. But it was you then it was like a revolving door because they go out to the street, uh, they would be fixed up in the hospital, be functioning better. But then once they got out, they would refuse treatment, and there was no way you could require them to receive treatment. So uh, that's why a lot of the people on the street. And uh, uh, one of the things that was a positive was uh, I had a friend of mine, uh, Lou Matthews, who had a son who was seriously ill and hospitalized. And she started the local chapter for the Alliance for the Mentally Ill, mm -hmm. which still continues. And it was a way to try and educate families about mental illness and provide a support system for them. And I think that one has still done well. Unfortunately, the current uh, mentally ill population and those that are uh, addicted are at the uh, county jail. They have just opening up a whole unit and that's become the new inpatient unit, unfortunately. There is um, UCLA, a UCLA group has studied Twin Towers downstairs, uh, downstairs, Twin Towers in Los Angeles, uh, the, the jail there. And they have exposed horrific treatment and horrific conditions um just to to reinforce what you're saying and and I also was thinking about how when they closed the hospital they had fewer workers um and they had fewer patients as well but they had more workers per patient and by that time there was more education more training and all of that was was very expensive and I think that's one of the basic problems right is the the cost and the tremendous time that these patients take in terms of diagnosing, in terms of um, drugs, in terms of behavioral modification and support programming. Um, it, it's incredible, incredibly complicated, right? So. Yes. All right, we'll turn to some of the questions. Um, at least one person has indicated they have photographs um, from when family members were here or by a friend. So please contact uh, Evelyn Taylor if you want to see about sharing some of your uh, photographs here. Uh, one question for Carol. Uh, the question is, what were the big wards like? Were the clients often medicated to calm them? Oh, yes. they. Well, um, most of them were on some sort of medication to begin with. Uh, so... Uh, but you have people on a unit that are uh, maybe hearing voices or have a lot of anxiety, um, and any little thing might set them off. So this could um, cause, you know, chaos on a unit, just one person alone. And what would happen, uh, you try to talk to them if that's possible. If not, then uh, they would need a uh, different medication to calm them down. Yeah, that was used, sure. Um, another question, did patients have visitors from family and friends? If, if yes, was visitation encouraged? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it was uh, unfortunate because I worked on an adult may, uh, unit that a lot of these people had worn out their relationships with their families from the behaviors that they've had. So we didn't get uh, large groups of uh, family members, but we certainly absolutely did. And uh, they could even uh, take people out into the community uh, if they were the conservator or if they had a conservator who would approve of it, if the, fam if the staff felt that the person uh, could handle it and certainly they would benefit from being off the unit with their family. Uh, that, yeah, that happened, sure, sure. We encourage that. Um, yeah, another one, which I think has been addressed, but a question for the group, uh, was the goal for patients to get treatment, rehabilitate and ultimately leave the hospital or were the patients expected to stay here for their lifetime? Well, the goal uh, was for them to leave the hospital. That was the goal uh, and to uh, reach a, uh, rehabilitate 
be really rehabilitated so they could go into the community and uh, uh, function. Uh, and that was the goal of the hospital, sure. And I'll add for the research for my book, I think it was the early 1960s, the age range of patients here was from the age of three to 104. So a very complicated population here to care for. Um, another question, they had a full service medical hospital question. Absolutely. They did uh, some minor surgery here. I heard tell that there were babies born here too in the old days. Yeah. I never yep. saw that, but uh, that did happen. Mm -hmm. I believe that was the uh, receiving a treatment building, right? The the one that was built where the hospital is today. Mm -hmm. That was right. part of that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so question... Let me see. Sorry, some of them are we've already have already addressed. I'm trying to sort through them here. Um, so I guess this is a broader or later. Did the they possibly the hospital follow Reagan's um, early discharge uh, plan when the new, more effective antipsychotic meds came out? So I guess how did uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, changes affect the hospital? I think that it needs to be pointed out that the hospital actually didn't close uh, until under Pete Wilson. Um, and, I, you know, this is just my opinion, but it wasn't really, well, you know, Reagan closed federal funding to the state hospitals. Um, and so that um, brought some issues, economic problems to the state, right? They were now forced to cough up the money. And, you know, early on, even in the, uh, the 70s, as, as I discussed, maybe even late 60s, you know, there were um, certain administrators in the state government who had the governor's ear about the fact that, you know, we, they were blowing money. Look at, you know, they, the farm was actually economical, mm -hmm. but they got rid of the farm and the ranch. And, you know, you just have a different mindset. And, you know, it's all about who's got the ear of who. And so then various uh, things in occurred. There's a whole litany which caused uh, Camarillo State Hospital to lose their patients. I mean, you can obviously see from the chart that I provided that it really dwindled down and they literally were closing unit after unit after unit. This is a really complicated subject because there were lots of different things that brought this to be. But the bottom line is, is that Camarillo State Hospital lost their patients. And so there you have somebody who says, well, as you can see, they're not getting the patients and we're spending X amount of money and we can be using X amount of money somewhere else. And so you can't really argue with that, except that of course, you know that there's a whole backstory that's not being told. And so again, the counties and the cities were supposed to sort of pick up that slack and then they turn to the private enti uh, entities. And so, you know, it's a very complicated subject as far as why the hospital closed. And I think that, um, again, I think it's really, it's awesome that we're all having this discussion and we're sort of taking the elephant out of the room and putting it right there front and center. Um, and I, you know, you really just have to kind of look at laws and and how that they can be changed to you know to help everyone i mean if you go back to the original lanham and petra short act it clearly states people who cannot take care of themselves right but we have not really followed that and there's been a lot of other mental uh health laws that have been enacted since then and so we've we kind of have to go back to the original and as the letter from um petros stated that wasn't their intention. They didn't want to close the hospitals. They were just saying you can't keep people forever. So, you know, I think that's something to keep in mind and, and maybe we can all put our heads together and figure out another way. I encourage people to write their legislatures and, and, and say, hey, look, we have to change something because we're, as Nan pointed out, we're right back to where we started a bazillion years ago. And that's not really the point of 
how we really want to be as a society, right? We want to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. So there you go. That's my two cents. And I think, and I think the use of drugs after 1952, they started using these psychotropic drugs in 1952. And I think that along with a desire to um, create community-based programs were really key in, in that decline in the hospital population. And then when Reagan came in, he certainly, um, his policies certainly did not help. In fact, I think Steve Axtell did those murals when they were getting ready for Reagan's visit to try mm -hmm. to gussy up the hospital and impress him, <laughs> according to um, some interviews. <laughs> I have something to add to that. They painted the hospital gr uh, grass green mm -hmm. uh, so it would look good. Yeah, for Reagan, Reagan and Nancy. Yeah, yeah, they did. It's a true story. <laughs> Thank you. And related to that, um, some of you in the in the questions have indicated family members who worked here and stuff like that. The anthropology program, as well as Evelyn and as archivist, have been collecting oral histories. So please contact mm -hmm. uh, either of us if you have more information to share. And with that, we're at our end of time. So thank you all for. Um, talking with us today about your experiences at, at Camarillo State Hospital. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I was thank hoping you. we'd be in person, but <laughs> not yet. We, we were able to get a lot more people together. We had over 100 participants this afternoon, this mm -hmm. morning. I want to thank you, Nan, Carol, Bill, Evelyn, Dr. Delaney for uh, volunteering and participating in this uh, conversation. Um, I saw lots of OLLI students, staff, faculty involved. So again, thank you all for participating today. This sem seminar has been recorded and will be placed in our OLLI events page at the end of the seminar series. We invite you to join us again for our last uh, seminar on Tuesday, May 9th from 10 to 12 to learn about the history of the beginnings of the CSUCI campus. Dr. Dan Wakely, son of Bill Wakely, Professor Emeris will be presenting and moderating a discussion of esteemed panelists, including two former presidents and a founding faculty member. Each seminar has a separate registration link. So if you have not registered for that, you need to register for that one. So you can choose which seminar you would like to attend. Uh, with that being said, thank you for all being here. Have a great, wonderful day. We have sun again today. Bye-bye. Nice